We're picking up where we left off and finishing up this whole retaining project. The drainage is in place, the washed rock and the filter fabric is where it ought to be. The dirt behind this wall has been compacted about right. And now we're following the engineer's plans and specifications for placing a rockery to hold back the top five or six feet of this lot. Just as important to follow their specifications with these rocks as it was to follow their specifications with the concrete. One of the things that really tickles me is this big old pile of dirt that's been plaguing my life for weeks is beginning to shrink. A lot of it has gone back into the hole and some of it is being put into these trucks and being hauled away. As we were putting that mountain of native soil in, in its appropriate location and compacting it, it became real clear that we had to haul some more of that junk away. It worked okay because we were, we were needing to haul these boulders in anyhow so the trucks could round trip. You know, we'd fill them up with junk, send them off, they would drop it at, at, the, at the pit that's being reclaimed, and then they would, you know, jump across the hill to the rock pit and load up with a riprap and bring it back. So it made it efficient. The only real additional cost in that whole operation was the front end loader time putting the dirt in the truck. So that kind of pushed the expense of exporting that material off site down. So these rocks, these boulders, these basalt boulders, it's called riprap around here, R-I-P-R-A-P. -R -R this comes from Umpqua Sand and Gravel's Looking Glass Pit. It's great rock. The reputation around here is that this is the pit to get riprap from. It appears to have what I think is some quartz in it, but I'm not sure. When you look at the way this stuff goes together and it locks together, it's a structural solution. We could have retained the entire perimeter of this slope with this rock, but because it needs to be put in at a slope, it would have reduced the buildable footprint of the lot. So we decided to hit kind of a sweet spot between vertical retaining with the concrete wall and uh, slope retaining with the riprap so that we get a better look. We didn't want it to look like a penitentiary, and, but still we maximize the footprint. But really, I never get tired of looking at riprap walls. They just look, you know, I mean, clearly a man did it. It's not the way God built it, but it's the material God built with, and man, I like it. You know, it's sturdy, it's organic, it's beautiful, and Dexter did a beautiful job with the rock that Umpqua Sand and Gravel provided for us. Let me just talk about that. Umpqua Sand and Gravel provided this stuff for us. They provided everything around concrete and the crushed and the riprap. They're a local family-owned business. This is not the first generation they have been providing real service for the residents of Douglas County for a long time. For me, they've been providing service since 1994. The best example I can think of to give you that speaks to the kind of service that I get from these guys is, we called them at the pit. We were setting these rocks and we came to this inside corner. We've got an eight foot drop here and a six foot drop here. And this is sort of the presentation corner of the whole project. We thought, man, we need a big rock. Now we had told them we needed rocks from, you know, two, to three feet in diameter, for, and that's what we were getting. But we called them at the pit and said, hey, we need a rock about four feet square. It needs to be about, have one 90 degree corner on it and be about a four by four. Sent the truck back over, he came back, dumped them out, whammo, there it is. I mean, it's got a 90, 90 degree corner. It's probably three and a half feet by four and a half feet by three feet tall. I mean, how often can you go to a rock pit on the phone and order the size boulder you want for a particular installation on a particular project. So it's too heavy for him to set from the top, so we're gonna move him down to the bottom side of the wall where he's not stretched out quite so far, give up a little bit of that leverage. The thing is double heavy and perfect. This combination of concrete and basalt rockery is quite imposing and a little heavy looking, but over time the color of the concrete will darken 
I may even acid stain it. We will landscape, we'll add ferns and moss and trees, all sorts of colors and textures that will reduce the impact of the structure. Also, someday there will be a house on this lower lot, on what now is my neighbor's property, which will essentially put the tallest part of this retaining structure out of sight behind a neighbor's home. The re this retaining wall was sort of a major balancing act or compromise. We were balancing appearance, structural integrity, safety for future homeowners, cost, and of course the most important part that we wanted to make great video content for our viewers. When you are on the front end of a project like this, you have to use your best judgment and then just go for it, and that's what we did. There are a lot of houses in this neighborhood built on similar slopes, and virtually all of them address the retaining wall, the retaining situation that they had on their individual lot in different ways. This is the way we picked. As you can see, these rocks are not just being dumped out and left where they land. There's a particular width that Carl Broda specified on the base course of this rockery in order to come up a certain distance. We knew how high we had to come and so we knew how wide it had to be and we knew what the slope needed to be on the face of this thing. Look at him place these things. I mean, he, he's moving them in half inch increments. He's wiggling them into place and then he's tapping them down to help them come to sort of a resting place. We decided to shake a little bit of this clean two inch into the gaps to sort of help them lock in there tighter. That degrades the appearance a little bit but not much because the material all came out of the same pit. I can imagine that Dexter is probably just about as anxious moment by moment placing these as I am moment by moment guiding these things in, you know, from six inches away. But after about half an hour of this, I realized, man, this guy's good at this. And while I could never take my eye off of what was going on, I got a feeling of, if not trust, at least confidence that if I was going to get hurt here, it was going to be because something broke and not because he made a mistake. I'm really delighted, not just with the appearance of this stuff, but with the, the clear structural integrity of a rockery like this. Gravity and the interlocking sort of characteristics of these irregularly shaped rocks make something that is reliable, structural and solid and exactly what we need. So rock pits mine rock. And when you mine rock, you drill and you blast and you try to fracture it into the sizes that you need for your crusher or for whatever your market is. Part of the market that has developed around here is for riprap, for these big bones for retaining walls. Now the giant blocks that sometimes come off this tall face have to be broken down further with a hydraulic breaker on an excavator. And so as he's breaking them down into the size that'll go into the crusher, he's also sorting it for the sizes that are used in retaining walls. This stuff is more expensive than crushed rock, even though it's not been crushed, because it is hard on equipment. It can't be handled with a front-end loader. They have to be handled one at a time. They knock dents in the bottom of dump trucks, and they hang up on the tailgates, and they wear out excavators. And so it's about 50% more cost for a load of riprap than it is for a load of crushed. By the way, all of these amounts will be on our Patreon account if you're interested. I don't know if this is an option for you in your area. I don't know what kind of rock underlays your surface, if it's hard enough, if it will weather, if it comes out of their pits in chunks like this. But if it is, and if the market, if people have not learned that this is a good way to use big chunks of rock, you might try it. Get some delivered to your site. Hire a good excavator operator and ask him to stack up a wall. It's a beautiful way to hold back the dirt. You may remember that this concrete wall sits about three inches onto my property. That means that this little cascade, I'll call it, this little pile of riprap that Brian is sitting with it, setting in place with his smaller excavator, are sitting entirely on the neighbor's ground. This is something that my neighbor knows about, he's aware of it, and he's agreed to it. In fact, the arrangement was that these rocks belong to him. 
and we are just installing them for him. Having these rocks here assists him with his retaining problems and erosion control and really helps smooth out the appearance of the, of the retaining structure to the benefit of both of our properties. This retaining wall system increased the buildable space on both of our lots and we're both delighted. I don't know if you can quite tell how dangerous this rock installation is, so let me point it out. The rocks weigh between 500 and 4,000 pounds. They're being brought into place by a machine that is not new, though it's well maintained, operated by a human being. Now between the human being and the machine, I have way more confidence in Dexter. This guy really knows what he's doing, and after about the first 10 minutes, I realized, wow, I can trust this man. He knows exactly what he's doing, and he can move this stuff exactly as carefully and as accurately as if he was holding it with his own hand. But the machine, the entire weight of those rocks and the boom of the machine itself is all being held up and moved around by hydraulic lines, isn't it? And if any one of those were to blow, explode, rupture, whatever weight it was restraining would instantly, and I mean instantly, fall. Now, I never forgot that. I mean, not for a second did I forget that. And so the the continual mantra I had in my mind as I was doing this and getting sometimes within inches of where the rock had to be placed in order to show Dexter where it had to be placed and how it had to be placed there, always in my mind was, okay, which way will I jump? Which way will I throw myself? What way am I going to move to get out of the way of whatever might happen? Now that needs to be something we're always thinking about, whether we're driving or wherever we are, if we have situational awareness, we're thinking of what would we do to remove ourselves from an immediate and unforeseen danger. It's a life skill, isn't it? Now, let me be very clear on this. I'll say it twice. I don't recommend any of you do this. Okay, let me say that again. I do not recommend that any of you do this, even professionals, because it is dangerous. And it would be a moral depravity to ask an employee to do this. This is the type of thing that I knew I could only do myself. I could not ask anyone else to do it. And in fact, I don't have any employees here. Now, Brian does. Brian's my subcontractor, and these other fellows are his employees. But nobody's getting out there but him or I. And the fact is, it was me as much as, as I could. And I wouldn't have done it like this if there were any other way. But there was not any other way. The placement had to be perfect because other people's safety for years and years would depend on these things these things being set perfectly so they can't, couldn't rotate or slip or shift or roll. They have to be in a final resting place before I walk away from this job. Have you ever seen a plate tamp like this? It weighs 1,500 pounds, and I've never used one this size. I've got a little one. You've probably already seen that in action. But I needed something that hit, it, that hit really hard, and this hits as hard as a small vibratory roller. But it's easier to move around. It's easier to maneuver, and it's reversible, and it can turn around almost in its own footprint. We rented this from United Rentals, which is a great company, by the way. I've been using them for a long time. They're a pretty good outfit, and they... They had this in stock and recommended it, and I'm delighted. Keep in mind, when the foundation goes in, there's going to be a lot more specific compaction that you're going to be learning about. What you're seeing us do on the top of this lot right now is just to get it tight enough to drive on, not to get it tight enough to build a house on. We're going to have to do a lot more over-excavation and putting in of structural fill and compaction and compaction testing underneath the footings of the actual house that will be even more detailed as far as site prep than the work that was done for this retaining wall. I hope it's become clear to you now that the concrete work that you've watched up till now has been to hold the lot, not to hold the house. Although, of course, if you don't hold the lot, then the house is not held, and so all of these things work together. But the next concrete that you see is going to be actual footings for the actual house, and we'll be starting that when the sun, when the sun shines again in the spring. So as we got to the last portion of the backfill, we got rid of the material we didn't want to use, 
We spread out the shale over the top that we wanted to have kind of up against the weather. We paid much closer attention to compaction around the perimeter now on the top behind the rocks because there'll be some bearing going on there of the structure. But we've put it to sleep. I mean, it's now a buildable lot. The people that may have bought this lot prior thought they were building, buying a buildable lot. They were not. This is a buildable lot. The next time a shovel hits the ground, it's going to be to excavate footings, work that will actually pertain to the construction of the house. Now then, if you're enjoying this, if you like the pace, if there's information coming that you either have been looking for or didn't know that you were looking for and have sort of added it to your, your fund of information, hang with us. Keep watching. We have just barely scratch the surface. From here on out, everything that we're going to be demonstrating and building and talking about is the work that actually happens when a house needs to emerge from a lot that's ready to build on. Thanks for watching. Thanks for liking. Thanks for commenting. By the way, thanks for commenting. And thanks for sharing this. Call somebody up. Email them. Send them a link. Spread this around because I think there's going to be some information here that people ought to have. If you're interested in the costs, if you want to know in real dollars what it is that we've spent here, check out our Patreon page. We're laying it all out right there if you're interested. Thanks for watching.